Hello, hello. How are you doing today? So today we are going to talk about how to handle difficult opposing counsel. Tell me the truth. Have you ever received an email from an opposing counsel and you just felt your chest tighten? Or maybe you dreaded going into court because you knew opposing counsel was going to pull something, right? They were going to say or they were going to do something that you considered unethical or devious even. If you have, know that I've been there too, and just about all of my clients have as well. It can cause a lot of problems when we are dreading going into court or dreading interacting with an opposing counsel. It can cause problems like procrastination because we don't want to do anything. We we freeze like a deer in the headlights. We ruminate. We waste time complaining to people in our office about their behavior or our family at home, Right. Or we do things that we don't like because they kind of numb us out. It helps us feel better in the moment, like over drinking or overeating. And we do things like lose sleep over our interactions. Maybe a single interaction that you have with an opposing counsel can bother you all night long. We also just can't think as clearly. We can't problem solve. We can't think about the simplicity of the situation that we're in and how simple the solution might be if we can't even clear our heads. We can even begin thinking that we're not cut out to be a lawyer or that litigation just isn't for us or we can doubt our abilities. This is really something that can be debilitating if we're not really handling it. And so in this episode, I'm going to help you know the root cause of how you're feeling. And we always think this, right? This is what our brain thinks is that the problem is outside of us, right? That it is the opposing counsel that is causing us to feel dread, causing us to doubt ourselves, to believe that maybe this just isn't the right profession for us. And that if only they behaved better, if more people in the legal profession behaved better or they were nicer, then we would feel better. But that's not the solution because we're going to have interactions in the world where people just aren't going to be as nice, right? Or they're going to have their own um, their own reasons for behaving that the way that they are behaving. And it's up to us to manage our mind, to manage how we feel. Because changing our life based on somebody, whether it's just procrastinating or we're losing some sleep or any of that that I just mentioned, that's a lot of power to give somebody to give somebody who's on the opposite side of counsel table or who we talk to very seldom. So in this episode, I want to help you feel more powerful in your law practice. And I want to help you recognize that you have more power in these situations to manage your emotions and take care of business than you might think right now. I'm going to give you a few examples of how to handle different opposing counsel behaviors. And then I'm going to give you some questions to ask yourself for any particular situation with opposing counsel you're in right now. So over the 15 or 16 years I was a criminal prosecutor, I experienced opposing counsel who lied, attempted to manipulate evidence, tried to rattle me, who were unhelpful, insulted me in open court, came up with random motions in the middle of a hearing, and would make up accusations seemingly out of nowhere from nothing. Now, I'd say about 97% of my interactions with opposing counsel were good interactions, right? Of course, we were going to have disagreements, or I might think that they're not being on the up and up about something, and then later on, I realize, oh, they just had a misinterpretation of the law, right? So there's those misunderstandings. But in this episode, I'm talking about the 2 to 3% of lawyers who use these kinds of tactics like lying and manipulating and trying to rattle you because those are behaviors that we do experience in the legal profession. And we label it as them being difficult. But I want you to keep your mind open in this episode because I'm going to share that there may be another reason. So when I was a young attorney, I had no clue how to handle these situations. I was really confused as to why anyone be would behave this way. And I thought for sure I shouldn't be a lawyer, right? I felt dread dealing with certain lawyers. And I felt really angry too at what I perceived as unprofessional and unkind behavior. I believed that they should be behaving better, that they should be different, that they should be more like me. And just have a conversation and not try to hide the ball. 
because if they would just communicate to me what evidence they had on their side, then it would make it easier for me to be able to communicate a better offer for them. But as time went by and I was exposed to coaching, I recognized that they weren't the problem. I was the problem because I was the one internalizing what opposing counsel did or said and made meanings out of them. I want you to just picture this really quick. So words come out of someone's mouth and we hear them and then our brain processes them. It's just a split second. We can't even see it. It's just so instantaneous that we hear the words, our brain makes an interpretation and we have a feeling, period, right? So we have a thought and immediately we might feel dread or anger. So it becomes really difficult for us to pause that instantaneous computer that is our brain and the chemistry that that thought creates in our body and help us see that we're making an interpretation. And sometimes it's a wrong interpretation. In fact, I would say most of the time, my brain's immediate interpretation is not the correct one. And we have to be able to sift through those. The way we do that is we start seeing different scenarios and where these different feelings are showing up in our life so that we can start to pinpoint them and we can start to pause our brain to slow it down so that we can calm ourselves in situations where we're feeling dread, where we'll, we're feeling angry. Now, in these situations where we are dealing with opposing counsel that are doing things like lying or yelling and attempting to really rattle us, our brain takes everything that we hear or we experience and it's, it goes through our brain and immediately we take it personally because we're just super self-centered. It's not our fault. That's how our brain works. <laughs> You're not the only one, right? So our brain sees no other option but to take it personally. So when I stopped taking these behaviors and these words that I would experience from these two to 3% of lawyers personally, it made my job so much easier. I became more understanding of what they were doing. I'm not saying I agreed with their tactics, but I could understand them. And it made me feel a lot better knowing that it had nothing to do with me. These tactics had nothing to do with me. They had to do with their clients and what these attorneys thought it meant to do a good job for their clients' interests. And we forget that, right? We forget that the opposing side is there representing their clients' interests. They may not behave the way we want them to behave. They may not behave the way we think they should be behaving, but that is what they are doing. And an example I love giving is an email I received from an opposing counsel. And in my brain's interpretation, when I read this email, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so rude. Why would he write me a letter like this? It was incredibly long. There were tons of bullet points. There was, you know, bold. There was lots of demanding and, you know, believing that they were in the right. And this is why they were in the right. And I could feel as I was reading this email, anger rising into my body. I was so indignant. But then I paused because at this point I had coaching tools. And I asked myself, who is this email for? Because it doesn't feel like it's for me. And I talked to this attorney before and we'd had a conversation. It sounded like we were on the same page about where this case was going. And then he sent this email to me after the fact. So I realized, hold on. This email is not for me. It's for his client. It's so that his client can read it and see that he was doing the best that he could for him, that he was really fighting me on this case and advocating for this client's position. And that was it. And later on, I confirmed this belief with the attorney because I was just like, I was so confused. I'm like, why did he send me this long email? And we had had this conversation about the case already. And sure enough, he said, oh, yeah, that was just for my client. So that's just one example where it's a misinterpretation. And our brain makes misinterpretations all of the time. But what about those attorneys who, in our view, are just behaving badly, right? And I've seen my share of them. Here's how I think about them. We tend to believe that everyone thinks like we do. And because I know who I attract to this podcast, I know that you're a heart-centered lawyer who's kind and who's considerate. You don't throw around accusations or insult people in court, right? You would never bring sanctions lightly. 
the most you probably do is roll your eyes, right? Like that tendency to believe that other people think like we do is called cognitive bias. And this came up recently in a call with a lawyer. They really hated responding to this particular lawyer's emails because she just dreaded opening them. Every time she opened one or, you know, she was talking about this lawyer, it seemed like he was making accusations. It was a pretty common thing. Maybe he would, you know, bring sanctions, that sort of thing. So when we talked it through, we looked at what she was making any accusation of wrongdoing against her mean. And it turned out she was making it mean that she had actually done something wrong. Right. So our brain wants to be right. And so our brain, when we receive this information, it's like, oh, wait a minute. It's on the lookout. It's on the alert. Is, is there something I did wrong? Let's look at all the ways that maybe I could have done something wrong. And that's all that was happening in that situation. Her brain was just internalizing an accusation even before she opened the email. Right. She was imagining what could happen, what could be in that email. And her brain was just believing what could have been said in that email, right? So if she took a moment, she knew she was 100% in the right and hadn't done anything wrong, but her brain's first reaction was to believe it. And I believe that our cognitive bias is at play here too, because we would never ourselves accuse anyone of wrongdoing unless it was true. So our brain can't believe that someone else would do that unless it was true. Once we know this tendency of our brain, it can take the sting out of interactions with opposing counsel, and it can allow us to think more clearly. If you really sit back, when you get an email and you read whatever email it is, even if you're incredibly uncomfortable reading it, if you read that email, you can look at it, and if you could separate yourself from what's being said in the email, it becomes a lot easier to handle whatever is in that email. So if you're if you're looking at it and let's say the opposing counsel is accusing you of doing something or says, you know, I'm going to bring sanctions or I'm going to do this or that or the other, or you're doing a bad job, whatever it is that that attorney is saying, if you are confident in your abilities, if you know that you are in the right, you can pause, even if you feel that momentary dread or maybe even belief, that guilt, like, oh gosh, maybe I did do something wrong. You can process that in the moment and say, hold on, my brain is just believing what this email says. Let's question it. Let's ask myself, is it true that I did something wrong? No. And he might want these things for his client, but it doesn't mean that that is a fair and just result. So ask yourself when you open these emails, are these things true? Question your brain. If you're starting to notice the emotion rise up like anger, question it. Who is this email for? Why are they writing this? Ask yourself those questions because those emails, when somebody is, like an opposing counsel is making threats or accusations, I guarantee you that they are doing it because of something they believe is the right thing to do. Okay, they have a different thought process than we do. Makes sense? They have a different brain, right? So they're thinking about it differently than we are. And so that email, it's just like the email that was sent to me that wasn't for me. It was for their client. That's what sanctions are for, right? Sanctions aren't because you're a bad person or you did something wrong, right? Or threats aren't about you and how you're behaving. And I know that you're acting on the up and up because I that's who I tracked in this in this podcast. So you have not, you've done nothing wrong. What the opposing counsel is doing is what they believe is what they need to do to advocate for their client. Okay. So that email, it's not for you. It's for their client. I had another client of mine who had a trial with an opposing counsel who would yell at her. Okay. He would raise his voice in court. He would have all these kinds of antics. Okay. He was just like wanted to bring attention to himself in the courtroom at all time. And we coached on her initial feelings of dread around these interactions and being able to just have that awareness, having that coaching around, okay, the yelling has nothing to do with me. Okay. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing or that I'm a bad attorney. Cause I believe this was her first experience litigating a case in court. It had nothing to do with her. And that transformed her appearances in that courtroom. 
She decided, because we worked together on this, she decided that she was going to be calm. She was going to be reasonable. And she was just going to let him do his thing. Let him argue. Let him yell. And she would be the voice of reason. Right? She would hear it. She would feel the feelings in her body. You know, she might feel a little anxious, but she would just take a breath. And she decided she was going to be the voice of reason. She was going to calmly state the facts. She was going to be the calm one in the courtroom when in front of the judge, in front of the jury. And her cool demeanor swayed everything, right? Because you know this from your own observations. When somebody is having a tantrum and behaving badly, you observe them and you're less likely to believe them you're less likely to hear what they have to say. You're more likely to listen to the person who is calm and composed and able to articulate something that makes sense to you. So that's exactly what happened here. We made such a contrast between her and this opposing counsel that it was a no-brainer who to believe. She initially felt like she needed to defend herself, like she needed to argue and stand up for herself. But we coached on that because... We knew, right, just like you know, listening to this, is that that calm demeanor is how she was going to get her point across and how she was going to win her case. And she did. Now, just hearing this story, why do you think the opposing counsel was acting the way that he did? Like, just think about it for a second. You might think he did it because he was a jerk, but I have another reason for you. The real reason is because he knew He didn't have a leg to stand on in his case. He had bad facts and he knew it. And he was furious that my client was calm because the only tool he had left in his toolbox was trying to rattle her. And that was not working. He was trying to do what he thought he could to win his case and advocate for his client. Not saying that that was beautiful behavior, But that is what his perspective was. And when I think about the behavior I would label as quote unquote bad, let's say, by opposing counsel over the years that I have witnessed, I don't think of them as bad people. Here's how I think about it. They were simply behaving in a way that they thought they needed to, to represent their clients to the best of their ability. Now, they might also have had some low self-esteem. That's another reason why people behave in those ways is because they feel like they have to to be kind of the showboat. I know I actually, in my early years, I'm not proud of it, but I felt that way too because I felt like I needed to impress my bosses. And so I had that that low self-esteem in my position, not really knowing, okay, am I going to be able to keep my job? And so I did what I thought they wanted me to do, which was kind of like argue tooth and nail for things. Or maybe they feel like they're losing a case and they're afraid of losing that case and what it's going to mean about them. Or they're trying to impress a client who is in court, right? I think about that when it comes to one particular instance where this this attorney just insulted me in court. And I think, wow, everybody else in that courtroom had my back. Like they were just so confused about this guy's behavior. But when I think back on it, his client was probably in the courtroom and that was how he was saving face, right? He wasn't going to get what he wanted and he knew it. So it's just understanding that people do things for different reasons. We might not behave that way, but other people do. And they're not bad people. It's just that's the only tool in their toolbox, Okay, they're not as diversified maybe as we are. So once I decide that their behavior has nothing to do with me, I'm free to decide deliberately how I want to show up in the relationship instead of reacting with anger. So how they're behaving, again, had nothing to do with me. Just like how opposing counsel, if you're thinking of one right now who's particularly frustrating when you think about them or you feel particularly angry when you think about them, What they're doing and saying has nothing to do with you or your performance, right? It doesn't mean you have to like them or grab a drink with them after court, but it does mean you have a choice, right? You have a choice to either allow them to rattle you or decide that you want to have the upper hand and know that how you want to approach the situation. 
So what I've done is I've created a list of questions that you can ask yourself, right? This is kind of like getting to coach yourself a little bit here. I want to give you a little taste of coaching for you so that if you're facing this situation, which let's face it, you probably are. Every single one of us has had an opposing counsel where we're like, wow, really? Why are they behaving that way? So I'm going to give you a list of questions. So if you're not driving, you know, grab a notepad and a pen and write these down. And I highly recommend if you are, you know, driving right now that as soon as you get to where you are, you you come to the website, you go to the show notes and you download the transcript because these questions are going to be in the transcript too. All right. So first of all, Number one, you're going to write down all your judgments about this person. We're just talking about one opposing counsel that is just on your mind right now, maybe even as you're listening to this podcast. I don't want you to hold back. I want you to write down everything you think about this person. Okay. I want you to judge the heck out of them. Okay. I know usually we don't want to judge people, but this is us getting it all out. And in coaching, you want to be free with your thoughts. You want to just free write everything if you're journaling this so that you can see all of your thoughts about this person. Now, number two, you're going to go back through that list that you just created of all those judgments, and you're going to notice how many of those judgments that you have about them do you have about yourself. A lot of times our judgments of other people are projections we have of what we believe about ourselves. So it's always good to go back, check through, and just notice Where are we judging them for things that maybe we're thinking about ourselves? Number three, how do you want this particular person to behave? So in your ideal world, how do they talk to you? How do they behave in court, on the phone? How do they write an email to you? I want you to picture the absolute most beautiful situation, the perfect situation, the way you want them to behave. I want you to write that down. Number four, Now I want you to read through number three and ask yourself what you would be thinking and feeling if they did all these things. What would you be thinking and feeling about yourself, about your capabilities, right? Because I want you to also notice that you're making them responsible for how you feel. You can actually think and feel the things you want to think and feel no matter what. It doesn't matter how they behave or what they say. Number five, ask yourself if you're just looking at who they are now and how they behave now, what can you expect from them? You know that they're going to say and do certain things. They are not going to change, right? We can't change other people. What are they going to do? Write it all down. Number six, why do you think this person does what they do? What thoughts do you imagine are driving them to behave the way that they do? Oftentimes when we start to see why they're behaving that way, we can become a lot more compassionate to them. And that compassion allows us to be a lot more calm in situations where we're facing opposing counsel that are quote unquote behaving badly. And this is something that I worked on is really having compassion for people People might be having a hard day. I know that I've I've been in situations where a, an opposing counsel was, you know, just, just behaving in a way that seemed really, uh, I was just, how I would interpret it as rude, right? But I knew that he was going through something, right? I didn't know what it was. It's not as if I had time to really talk to him about it in the middle of court, right? But it, I knew something else was going on. And it's so important to remember when we do see behavior that we wouldn't do, that oftentimes those people are under under incredible stress. And, you know, I've seen this happen multiple times. I've done it multiple times, right? So I'm not exempt from this. I'm not proud of that. But when we are under incredible stress, sometimes we are under that that pressure we we feel like we're in a pressure cooker and so then we maybe explode in little ways that we aren't anticipating and it impacts people so even if you notice other people are behaving badly i guarantee you that at some point in time you've probably behaved badly yourself 
So having that compassion for other people, it really has helped me behave better in those kinds of situations. All right. So number seven, I want you to ask yourself, who do you want to be in this relationship, right? Think about who you want to be. Don't let their behavior determine how you show up. It's so easy if we're faced with somebody who's being snappy or, you know, argumentative for us to feel defensive and react to that feeling of defensiveness and bark back at them. I want to offer to you that that is not going to get you the result that you want. Just think back to that situation where I was talking to my client and she had an opposing counsel who was yelling in court, who was really trying to use every tool in his toolbox to rattle her. But because she didn't allow that defensiveness to rule her reactions and she just stayed with that emotion and she sat and she was calm with it, she was able to be that voice of reason. And so that's what I want to offer to you is that you can be that voice of reason. You can decide that you want to show up calm and cool and collected and be that voice of reason that the judge or the jury listens to. Okay, so now that you have those questions, this is something you can come back to this episode anytime that you notice you feel frustrated with an opposing counsel because it's going to remind you that you get to choose who you want to be in relationship with that opposing counsel, no matter how they behave, right? No matter what you think or how you think they should be behaving, you get to decide who you want to be in that relationship. What they do has nothing to do with you. All right. And if you want to take what you're learning in this podcast and you want to put it into practice so that you can love your life and your law practice, let's work together. Coaching is a tool, right? It's a tool that pro athletes use so that they can be high performers, that top entrepreneurs use so that they can be top performers while reducing stress. And because we can't be top performers when we're in a stress situation, when we feel overwhelmed, it's a tool that we need and can use to do the same thing. So I encourage you to book a strategy session with me. And what we'll do is we'll talk about where you are now, where you see yourself. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Where are you feeling that show up in your life? What are the particular problems that you see showing up in your law practice, whether it's opposing counsel, like we talked about in this episode, or boundaries with employees or clients or what have you. And then what we're going to talk about is where you want to be. Where do you want to see yourself in six months, a year from now, so that you are really starting to create the life that you want actively? And so you and I are going to work together on that, and we're going to create a game plan to help you get from where you are now to where you want to be and make it a simple plan, one that's doable, one where you're not turning your life upside down. I think one of the things I hear so often from lawyers is that they're afraid they're going to have to just flip their whole life upside down in order to make the changes that they want to see. And what I tell them is that, no, it's not that at all. We do it incrementally. We take it step by step by step. Because if we flip our whole lives upside down, it makes it impossible to create sustainable habits so that we can create the life that we want. We're much more likely to create what we want in our life if we see it's doable. And so in order to do that, we take it step by step. We prove to our brain, yes, it's happening, it's working. And the more evidence we create, the easier it becomes to create change. So if that's something that you've been thinking about, if you've been thinking about coaching, but you've been maybe concerned that you'd have to flip everything upside down, I want you to know that's not how coaching works. It works better because we take it incrementally step by step. And you can book a strategy session with me at dinacataldo.com forward slash strategy session. All right, my friend, remember what you want matters and it's within your power to make it happen. I'll talk to you next week. Bye.